the battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Lead Pursuit Podcast. Tonight, I'm talking to the entire team again and a special guest from Adepticon. But the most important thing everyone needs to remember is we are the smartest podcast that's out there. Now, it's not because our content is great. It's not because we always ask the right questions, but it's because we have the common sense to do two things. One, when we leave a laptop with the tech support guys, we clear our Pornhub database. And two, when we pay hush money, we pay it out of our pocket funds, not Lead Pursuit corporate funds. Anyway, I'd like to g- greet the Lead Pursuit team tonight. Casey, how you doing? I'm good. Just uh, getting my laptop and putting some state secrets onto War Thunder forums tonight. But besides that, I'm going good. Hey, that's a perfect way to release classified information <laughs> or in a congressional hearing, either one, you know. <laughs> Brett, how are you doing tonight down there in Florida? I'm doing great. Uh, trying to come up with some Stormy Daniels references, but I got nothing. Yeah, well, they're just way too easy. So, <laughs> Steve, how are you doing tonight up there in Pennsylvania? Is it, doing- you know. I'm Warm doing, weather yet? I'm doing great, and I can confidently say I would neither ever give money to that horse face. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure that you are not under indictment uh, by the New York uh, State DA because you are in a neighboring state. So, you know, uh, Blue For- Falcon Hobbies might have done business in New York, so we got to be careful here. Anyway, uh, we're, are, we are joined tonight by none other than Mike Rafferty, our favorite Adepticon Historicals lead. Mike, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Doug. You know, just kicking some money up to the big man here. <laughs> well, it's funneled through my channel. Yeah, it seems like there's always a big man with their hands in our pockets, whether it's federal government or state governments for business taxes. Good old lead pursuit, I guess, did too well last year. Uh, or if it's John Russell. Yes, John Russell, you're getting another order from me. So <clears throat> we have to fill out the lead pursuit uh, stockpile again. <laughs> I have purchased a lot of A Song of Ice and Fire since ooh, Adepticon. Ooh, now that's, see, that's a different big man with their hands in your pockets. Mine is a bunch of guys that are no longer a company anymore, SPI. Uh, anyone who saw <laughs> that uh, the post after, uh, after Adepticon, I did not drop a load of money in the vendor hall. So I'm, I apologize, Adepticon vendors. Uh, but I did go over and buy way too many out-of-print games uh, by SPI. Hex Encounter games, yes, all you miniature guys can hate me. Um, but I went back and, and bought a bunch of Hex Encounter games, and I was quite happy to do it. But that's all right. That's that's my own uh, secret sorted life. So let's. Well, and Games Plus is uh, the Game, kind of vendor, they, so it's all it's, fine. It's true. They, they are. They uh, they're a great team over there. They're always fun to go talk to. I know Brett and I got lost in there for hours on end, and Brett's finally like, I have to go to the airport. Um, so he pulled me out of the the vintage game locker, and I I've finally paid my multi hundreds of dollars and left in shame. Uh, but anyway, so. So we're going to do a real quick overview before we delve deeply into Adepticon because it was a great experience. The Lead Pursuit team had a blast. We uh, we definitely all had a good time getting together, seeing a lot of the other war game players, both miniature, uh, you know, the uh, historicals, uh, all the different categories. Um, but we want to kind of give the wave tops. So we're going to each cover one of the best things about Adepticon. And one of the worst things, because it's lead pursuit. We'd never miss an opportunity to be negative, would we? Uh, But let's start with Casey. Casey, what's your best and worst thing uh, out of Adepticon? So my best thing, I mean, I've been to dozens of cons. Adepticon's always amazing. They do a great job. But for me, with this being so busy with work this year, not really getting to get out and do much, just being able to get the whole team together and have fun. You know, we played a lot of games. We ran a lot of games. Just we got to go to the bar every night. We got to go to dinner. We had an amazing steak dinner. Thank you. Um, you know, we just had fun. And it was just nice to finally just get together, even if we were just sitting around BSing, even if you were making us paint planes. But it was still fun. <laughs> no, so I just really enjoyed that. That's what it's all about for me is just having fun, hanging out with the guys. Like they could be sometimes abysmal cons, but, you know, if we're together, having fun, that's what matters. So that was my high point. Um, Low point, and this is very subjective, and I don't want to come off like a little whiny bitch, but good thing this is explicit. 
Um, I don't think I went for the whole VIG bag. I was one of the lucky ones that got it right um, from refreshing my computer 37 times and shutting down the power in Austin. But I don't think it was worth it in the end. I don't know if because I mainly play more historical games and I should know that going to a Defticon is not a historical con. But also just big bulky boxes made it extremely hard to fly home with. I gave away the majority of it. Yeah, the Games Workshop killed great. And, you know, that's – I don't, I can't even think what the retail is, but it's got to be close. But I don't think I'll ever do it again. Like what am I going to do with a thousand-piece, you know, Gloomhaven puzzle? Or uh, give it to me. Know. Oh wait, I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I have one. You have yeah. nine. What am I going to do with a box of blind arms? <laughs> but like, you know, it's just I don't think, and you know, that's like I said, purely subjective. Some people probably love this stuff, and it's cool to see all of it. But in the end, I might get some of the specific swag. Like I really like the uh, the beer glass, the dice. Like that's cool. The coaster, but I don't need like a box of War Machine and some of the other things. Yeah, so and, and that'll said, that'll be an interesting thing for us to talk about uh, as a group later on because I think there's a lot of um, a, a lot of inputs on that that everybody has about swag bags after the last couple of years. Yeah, and I would okay. like to see real yeah. quick. I would like to see more historical stuff in it. Yeah, Warlord through the sprues of Napoleonics, which Steve should be eternally grateful for, but <laughs> in fine arms. But like maybe as a way to get more in it, like let's try to reach out or try to get some of these other historical manufacturers to put some stuff in there so people see and they're like, oh, what's this? And it starts that ball rolling. Well, and that's the big thing, you know, talking about that is that's on the manufacturers to provide that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Like this year, Battlefront Gale Force 9 did the board games. Right. Versus anything else. So, you know, all of that stuff is provided by the vendors in payment really for their booth or other forms of advertising or things like that. So it would be on the historical vendors say, hey, let us provide swag bag items and traditionally one of the main barriers to entry on that has been the quantity yep but before we dwell on that we're going to move on to brett brett your top and bottom events well i was really impressed i had a great time for the uh, furball and the thing that i liked the most was um seeing some folks there was a there was a couple that came at stick and monks i think they were on my end of the table played for the first time and then hung around a little bit afterwards. We're asking questions like how to best make their own like custom starter kit for Blood Red Skies. And then the very next day, you know, they're back over there playing and stuff. And that just that was just awesome to see. And it was a big, it was a big bunch of people. Would you have over twenty people out there playing? On yeah, the yeah, it was, it was a good setup for the furball. Uh, and they did exactly what we uh, suggest people do: is go make your own starter set if you don't like uh, zeros versus uh, wildcats. Was, All right. So, what was your worst? Uh, it was hard for me to come up with a worse. Um, you know, I kind of want to say like the weather was hard on me, uh, but uh, it, <laughs> it wasn't it, Florida. I'm sorry. Was, I think it was. I had my roommate strangely used all the hand lotion, <laughs> all the body lotion, and so I wasn't able to keep my hands moisturized. And so I had some chafing on the backs of my hands. So I, I, I need to make sure I come with I, my I hate own it when body that lotion happens, next you time. Know. We'll get you a better roommate next time. <laughs> Speaking of roommates, uh, Steve, what was your best and worst? Uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of speechless right now. I thought that was in confidence, you know, I didn't, <laughs> don't know why I had to put that out there for everybody, but my best was absolutely, uh, getting to play the sky fortress in, uh, our aeronautica imperialis event, which is basically just nice. like a free Yeah. You enjoyed all, that too much. Just shoot anybody down. And especially cause I didn't really, I had so much fun, but looking back on it, I didn't even really play any games. You know, we were just hanging out and doing stuff. And I played a small game of Oak and Iron. So that was really the only dice that I rolled. And it was just great because it was just free for all. Shoot everybody down. It was awesome. My worst uh, was that I now, unfortunately, have this lone sprue of... 13.68794 13.68794 millimeter Napoleonics that like Napoleonics are like my sworn enemy. They are my, my arch nemesis. And now my home is no longer a Napoleonics free zone. So I have to find some, <laughs> find somewhere to go with these Napoleonics. That's absolutely my worst. You could melt them down and make a 40 K sprue out of them. Oh, there that's you true. go. I should try that. You didn't give yours yeah. to Casey. I think I gave mine to Casey. <laughs> I think Casey got loaded up with everybody in our group sprues. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So that's good. Let's let's cover mine real quick. So 
my best was the shuttle. And, and people may laugh about that, but as an event organizer and as someone who had a really tight schedule, uh, the shuttle was awesome. And it was great to not have to fight for parking, knowing that we're going to be at the Hyatt. And then it also led to people being able to be involved in events at the Hyatt and at the Renaissance on the same day and not worry about finding parking or transiting. Once you parked, you were good uh, and you would just go to Adepticon and experience Adepticon as a whole. So that was awesome in in my book. And I think we've been talking about it. That might be the secret sauce. Like you could go for 40K or heresy, stay at the high and take the shuttle and probably have a better experience overall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And not fight, not fight parking and everything else. Yeah. So I think there were also people that stayed off site that said, screw it, I'm going to park at the Hyatt because there's parking there and then catch the shuttle over uh, to the main venue. So that it opened up a lot of possibilities. And now, you know, that being said, uh, people are people. So my worst is lines. Now, you go to an event the size of Adepticon, there's always going to be lines. There's going to be lines to go get in the vendor hall. There's going to be lines in front of your favorite you know, vendor that has My Little Pony chibis. Uh, there's going to be lines to go to the bathroom. There, there's lines everywhere. But what was funny to me, and it's it's a just a weird human nature thing. It's like, why do people stand in a three hour line for a Disney ride that's 15 minutes? Everybody has to get registered between six and nine p.m. on Wednesday, and and I did it too. Uh, I jumped and stood in the line. Uh, Pat Doyle and and his son Matt and I uh, stood in the line for quite a while. We were not line breakers like some other lead pursuit people who remain nameless. Uh, but the the fact is, man, the lines are just a pain in the ass. I, I don't know if there's any way to solve it. Uh, when everybody shows up for registration all at once, you're going to have a line. And I think the Adepticon crew did a good job of breaking people down. I did have a funny scientific observation, though, and, I, and I'm not sure how it worked out. But literally, the first row in each of the thirds, as, as they broke you up by name, the first row was almost always empty. So like A through C. Apparently, nobody that goes to Adepticon has a last name ending in A through C. There's like five of them. And likewise, I think it was I through J. Also, there's like four of those people that went to Adepticon because it was so funny because in each of the thirds, there'd be the other lines and then that first line was always empty. So whatever, not a big deal, just a, a humorous observation. But you know, it's it's not all about what our opinions are. So Mike, I'm going to throw it to you because as the leader of the historical band over there, you saw a lot of different things. You obviously uh, also saw what was going on over at the Renaissance. What are your best and worst item out of Adepticon 2023? So I'll echo the shuttle. Um, I drove over there on Saturday and I regret it horrifically. <laughs> yes. Um, I, dropped, but- I dropped the kids off at the front door and drove in circles for about 15 minutes. So. Oh my god! I, yeah, it was pretty rough. Dad, can but, we go to a you know, <laughs> and and you're correct. We're starting to see a lot more people even just recommend, "Hey, park at the Hyatt, take a shuttle over," as being a lot easier. You know, adding some extra shuttles this year helped a lot. Um, I know several other people took the shuttle, so you know that's definitely something we're going to reinforce for next year. But that seems to be an area of success. Absolutely. And your worst. There had to be um, something that drove you batty. Besides the Lead Pursuit podcast being the whiny little bitches they are. I need more tables. I need better power. Oh, my God. The internet's slow. My internet's slow. <laughs> exactly. Dead. We don't have a streaming setup yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, And you came in too late to play board games. But anyway, um, you know, tables was a little bit of an issue this year. Um, and that's just something, you know, we talked to hotel, we worked it out. So next year won't be an issue. You know, luckily with how our events were structured over at the Hyatt, we we're able to kind of move stuff around during the day. Other events were able to be flexible and use round tables instead of square. Yep. So it, it all worked out in the end, but it could have been a much larger issue than it basically ended up being no issue. Right. Well, and I saw there were people, there were games that I didn't even realize went on out in the hall because they were during a period when we were busy. Uh, and I saw photos. I'm like, where was that at Adepticon? Then I realized that was out in the hall. So, right. yeah. So I think you guys used a lot of the space and used it well. I, I do, I am concerned, I guess is the way I should say it. I, um, it's, it's y'all's problem to solve, but I am concerned that as historicals keeps growing and more people, want to do historical things. I know uh, more people want to come for Blood Red Skies next year. So there'll be a demand and, and we'll have to see what we can do to shuffle tables and times and everything else around. Well, and I think part of that's going to end up being like, if I look at table utilization this year, Friday and Saturday for very heavy. 
and then Thursday was pretty light and Sunday was non-existent. Right, right. I mean, that's why we came up with the Mig Alley game was just we recognized there's basically nothing going on Thursday. Absolutely. So that might be something we look at a little more next year of as people want to run more games. OK, let's try to spread this out a little bit more um, to fill up some areas where there's one, you'll have a better chance of getting people in your game because there's nothing else going on. Two, it'll let us utilize the tables better. Oh, right. And and as I promised we would do uh, talking through this in the in the preamble before the show, mm-hmm. I think I think there's gonna have to be some data to look at that because what's interesting to me is the people who showed up Wednesday night and were in the registration line. And what was the percentage of historical gamers versus and I'll call mainline gamers, <laughs> the the ones that were over at the Renaissance for some of those things. And I think, I think we'll have to kind of see what people registered for and when they showed up and then realize sure. that some of the events can move to Thursday. I mean, there are, there are main game events on Thursday in the other hall. They aren't all just Friday, Saturday, and there's still some on Sunday. So, um, it's it's just something we'll have to look at, and everyone's going to have to realize there's a there's a finite amount of time uh, to get everything in. Correct. I, I feel like people saying, "Oh, Sunday's just a travel day." You're really missing a lot of opportunity there. I mean, if you look at the Marriott day two of the 40k team tournament, day two of the Age of Sigmar team right. tournament, those are probably our two main like two premier events. They're going on on Sunday. Absolutely. And I, and I laughed. There were still plenty of players Sunday evening as, as things wound down that came over and were playing in the lobby at the Hyatt. So there were obviously people oh, that absolutely. lived over at the Hyatt for the for the weekend. Uh, the rest of their crowd had kind of dispersed, but they came over and played. There was a big Armada going on, game going on and a couple other things. So, you know, it's there's still gaming going on. I think organizers just have to have to see, is there group dynamic willing to support that? And, and I think a lot of them are. I mean, um, I, I think there will always be people who say that doesn't fit my schedule, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I know we had people uh, ask about putting Aeronautica somewhere other than Saturday night. Um, maybe that's one of our options is Aeronautica goes to Sunday morning. Uh, but there's there's certainly um, a lot of people that are sticking around and there were a lot of people playing pickup games uh, on, on Sunday. So, No, absolutely. And yeah, I was having a conversation earlier with someone about another historical event. And it comes down to if you build something that's interesting that people want to come to, they'll figure out how to come to right. it. You don't need to figure out all the stuff. Like I, they were talking about, oh, what about hotel rooms? What about time off work? They'll figure that yeah, out that, if they want to yeah, attend. That's, that's not our problem as out. the event organizer. <laughs> Correct. Well, and a good example. Our problem is how to make it appeal. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that was one of our considerations. As you all presented to us, you and, and Don said, um, let's do MIG Alley on Thursday. At first, my initial thought was, oh, I don't know how big that's going to be. And then I remembered that in part of the Aeronautica discussion, people had said, hey, I can't make the sun, the Saturday game. Can you host a separate Aeronautica event on Thursday? And we, we obviously opted not to, but there's a lot of gamers that Thursday is either their hobby day or their free day to go hit mm-hmm. the vendor hall, their day to kind of you know get caught up with what's going on. Uh, so I think that a lot of game systems can and should exploit Thursday the whole day and um, and Sunday in the morning. Correct. Uh, but that that does bring up kind of kind of one other question um, because one of the reasons that a number of people had Thursday free uh, was because the hobby seminars filled up so fast. Uh, and a lot of the the small density game events filled up so fast. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to beat you up uh, ad nauseum about the uh, the debacle that was registration because we know there was obviously a service outage in C event C event uh, sure. kind of stirred the pot for you guys. But has there been any discussion of things that could be done differently to streamline the registration process or to break it up? Because quite frankly, it's it's been a frustration every time I've ever gone to Adepticon. It's it's nothing new. It's you sit there and you click on, you click, 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 and you get through as fast as you can. And then you go back and register for the events you want uh, with a separate registration. I've I've never known an Adepticon registration that's any other way. And this year was just kind of a perfect storm of that. When Cvent went awry, that derailed the whole clicking refresh 27 times. (laughs) So I'm going to say a couple things are going to sound crazy, but bear with me for a second. Yeah, no crazy than what I normally say. (laughs) One is... As far as I understand, CVET is used by Gen Con. Right. 
So it's not like Cvent is a very large player. Yeah, they're not in this a mom and pop operation. <laughs> exactly. It's not like we're using Bob's Ticketmaster or whatever right. from down the street. Like this is a large player. So it's one of those. There's not really someone else we can go to like this, especially trying to keep fees and expenses reasonable. Absolutely. Um, but more so, there's just not a better option really out there. Um, two, and this is the crazy part. The system work. It just obviously now you have the server issue with the bandwidth and everything that I, I also heard a potential thing that basically the insane amount of traffic that started, you know, immediately at 2 p.m. They thought it was a DNS attack. Right. So I, it, or a DDoS. it wouldn't surprise me that they accidentally secured their own server yeah. against everyone trying to actually register that. That would not be far from the, the believable. My experience, it did take me 45 minutes to register, but I kept going back and it would say, do you want to start a new cart? I'd say no. So it saved my VIG that entire time right. because I never let it go the 15 minutes to expire. And I just kept going till eventually the traffic had moved through the server and I could finally get through yeah. it. Now, our, we are definitely in talks with Cvent to try to improve for next year. Every year we tell them, look, Please get more bandwidth for this hour on this day. Right. Well, and I think there's um, there's two problems there, and I'm going to pick on Casey because Casey's the poster child for it. Um, sure. That because he's our VIG guy in this group. Uh, that the <laughs> VIG people put so much into getting the VIG, and I'm not sure. One Adepticon is is seeing the the real return on that because it's creating more pain in a sense than it's than it's incentivizing people to sign up um and, and and likewise people quite frankly are acting like little bitches because they couldn't get the vig bag and i say that as someone who every year tries to get the vig bag i get it sure um trust me i i was happy to spend extra money to get an insane amount of swag but that didn't stop me from going to and enjoying the convention so I, I'm going to be quite frank. I think a bunch of Adepticon attendees need to shut the fuck up and need to realize that the VIG bag is one component of registration. And likewise, Adepticon needs to realize that after some of us decided to give up on the VIG, we still couldn't register. I think I think I got back in two right. hours later. Um, so so there's something that needs to be done, and I, and I wish I knew the right answer. I, we, we are not like other uh, podcasts or, or vlogs that say, here's our white paper. We know what all the answers are. I, I don't know what they are, but I think, Oof. I think there's, well, let's hope you'd write a white paper. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to write a white paper. Sorry. I do that for my real job. <laughs> no more white papers. Um, but I, I think there's a, uh, there's a reality that something needs to change to lower the, the traffic on the server and not make it all about the VIG, which right now, uh, apparently everybody wants the VIG bag. But What's funny is you go into all the game stores and people are selling the VIG stuff that they just got. So it's kind of weird. So I am going to separate Mike from Mike Adepticon <laughs> yeah, sure. to just Mike personally. Yes, that frustrates me in no end where you see people like, oh, well, if I sell this part, it pays for all my VIG. It is very frustrating. And obviously, at the end of the day, it's your stuff. Do what you want right. with it. Do I really care? No. Um, I'm also not saying they're whining that if I don't get VIG, my whole Adepticon is ruined. <laughs> I got it this year. I didn't even try for it last year. So, you know, my Adepticon was fine last year. <laughs> yeah. But I assure you. Um, at the same time, you know, Casey, I know you were talking about you didn't obviously see the value in parts of it. And that's true. It's At the end of the day, the stuff in there is only value by do you individually want that stuff? Yeah, that's why I preface it. It's completely subjective. Like. A- absolutely. Um, it's something I look at as it sells out in five minutes, and we can just do top of the head math, and there's five, six, seven hundred dollars worth of value in there. Is it under costed? I don't know. Yeah, uh, the economist in me says yes. Yeah, that's. That's one of the the interesting questions for me is is are are people getting so much value for it that there's there's no thought of of um, am I paying an amount that's worth it because I'm getting such a crazy amount of stuff? Well, if you look, the GW box alone exactly. is worth more than the entire VIG bag. Yeah, yeah. So, which but yeah, that, then it comes I, back to your secondary point that 
that's how these vendors pay for their spaces by putting things in Correct. the VIG bag. Now, some of them are things that everybody wants and is willing to fight over, like the uh, like the the boarding uh, actions box. Um, some of them are are just discards, like 400, 800, whatever combined arms. Uh, yeah, thanks, Warlord. So that that proved to me that combined arms did not sell uh, at all because it was the giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> but but thank you, Warlord. It, it hopefully got the game out there, and I think it. In a sense, it, it did what we joked about on the podcast, um, that it is going to get it in people's hands. They wouldn't have spent money to buy it, but now they're going to realize, oh, I can do something with all of these pieces and parts, and maybe the system isn't the best for Blood Red Skies, but it works for Bolt Action, and they're going to make their own sure. campaign system because now they've got little tanks to push around on a map. So, And the funny part is, I'm not upset that I got combined arms. I'm upset that I bought combined <laughs> arms. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I could have free. Yeah, yeah. But- you know, I'm happy now my group's got a couple copies of it. So, you know, it's something we might give a try here over the summer. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I've made the point uh, to John Russell and a couple people that if you really want to play a, a operational campaign, but not follow the combined arms rules, you kind of need two sets because you need enough of, of everything to, to give it some flavor of a, a front line and not just random units. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, they obviously wanted to get rid of a bunch of copies and they could pay for their booth with it. So it was a win-win a for win-win. Yeah, win-win for Warlord and everyone else. Well, and that's the big part I look at is you're not paying that much for VIG. And versus overall, I think our badge price is a very, very fair price. And I compared this to Gen Con, right. which I went to uh, the summer and it was $85 for one day. And, and, and you can't get in anywhere enough. without the badge. So yes, you can't get anywhere without the badge. It was eighty five bucks just to walk around. Exactly. And I, I think you might be able to check out games from the board games library. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, that's I. That's I, one of the differences between Adepticon's model and and other people's yes. model. So. And that, you know, the funny thing is like people always talk about, oh, why don't you go to a bigger venue? You know, because it's just really easy to go to a larger venue. You just <laughs> you just pay you just a shit ton more money. Oh, wait, Casey, that's you what look at Millennium Gen Con, Con had to do, right? <laughs> no. Oh, don't get me started. You look at Gen Con, they are at a larger venue. I mean, they basically at this point run downtown Indianapolis. Right. Those are the costs associated with running a larger venue. Absolutely. And I think the reality is a lot of the gamers – are, uh, while they may have discretionary money to buy miniatures and do some of these things, overall, people don't want to spend a ton of money on the event itself because everything else costs so much. The hotel, the travel, the food, yes. you know, that when you get down to it, the badge is the thing people really would like to spend the least on um, because all the other stuff is a, is a cost of going to an event anyway. Uh, Absolutely. It, it's You add all this together and decide, hey, is this worth me going? Am I going to get enjoyment out of it? Right. And I've always followed Depticon. You know, we actively strive to give people as much value as possible for what they're spending. Hey, I'm just happy that the beer is cheaper over at the Hyatt. So my, my beer drinking was uh, was less expensive this year than in previous years where I spent most of my time <laughs> at the Renaissance. So, uh, well- Talking about the swag in general, Casey, Brett, Steve, anything else uh, you guys have to say specifically about the swag bag? Yeah, you know, I kind of wanted to echo the same thing there, right? So, like, I this year, I was like, I'm going to buy the VIG bag, right? Again, if you let the fact that you didn't get the VIG bag dictate that you're just going to hate your entire time there, uh, I think you're kind of missing the point of yeah. Adepticon, right? And it's kind of <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't really understand that mindset. Like they're little plastic toys. You can go buy whatever little plastic toys you want. You buy the VIG bag. There's no guarantee you're going to get something you like anyway. Uh, I, I just, I feel like, like Casey said, the best part of it for me was playing some games, hanging out with everybody, seeing people. I feel like, the the games are kind of the catalyst that gets everybody there, but the real reason you go back is like, oh hey, we had fun playing that game last year. We did, you know, like yeah. the whole swag bag thing is just kind of like I don't understand how it becomes that that well, big a deal. There was a there was a funny corollary to it because as I was standing going through the line, unlike some line jumpers who are made nameless, Brett, but uh, as I was standing in line. And they were coming up and saying the staffers were coming by, going, yeah, anyone with the VIG, go up here. Uh, literally. 
the number of people that were like, ah, I'd be in that line if I'd got my VIG bag, but the registration blew and this is all their fault. And I'm like, so did you want the VIG bag for head of the line privileges or did you want the VIG bag to get the swag? So does does Adepticon just need to have a head of the line privileges thing where I don't give you any swag, but you pay more money to not stand mm-hmm. in line with everyone else? Because we can do that too, you know. Oh, good. <laughs> Hundred bucks will hand deliver your badge. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's one of those where people will bitch and complain about everything, and it was Correct. just hilarious to me uh, to stand in the registration line where I'm like, "Look, guys, I, I just want to get the registration and and get my badge, and maybe see people in the registration line I know and have a conversation as we're winding our way through every corner of the Renaissance downstairs." <laughs> uh, but that's all right. I'm not bitter now, not at all. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Lead Pursuit events. Uh, and Mike, please jump in. Give us your perspective as the organizer. Were we a pain in your ass? Were we value added on these things? Yeah. Um, what you saw? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but, uh, you know, things that you saw, because uh, you are also participating in a number of the events. Um, our first and and big one kicking off was the MIG Alley event. So that was a lot of fun. And, and Mike, thanks to you guys suggesting it. And oh, by the way, painting some of the miniatures for it uh, and really pushing the idea. Um, you two over there at Historicals pretty much suckered me into that. And I'll, I'll put it that way. It was it was an awesome event. Um, I totally feel like I was taken advantage of, but I loved every minute of it. Um, so it was uh, that was a lot of fun. How did it play out for you? Is that what you kind of thought the the uh, Meg Alley was going to look like? You know, honestly, I did not have a lot of expectations come into it. <laughs> it's late pursuit. I, I, They'll I, screw I, it up. <laughs> right. No, it. a lot of it's more so I have a like Don said he was going to run that. So as you know, I have my things I'm worrying. If he's like, hey, I can run that. I trust him to run it. It's like, cool. You guys got this figured out. It's like, OK, Doug's helping him. Great. It'll be fine. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I can just trust you guys do it. I was like, OK, it's going to be something. I, I like the B-29s a lot. That looked pretty cool. And I'm like, you know, worst case, still have fun. Yep. Yep. Brett, good job on the B-29s. Those are good to finally have gotten back on the table. I think it's been a couple of years since we've played with those. You know, if you want to print me off a couple, <laughs> I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I don't think we've seen those since uh, since New Orleans, right? Yeah, I think I think New Orleans. Did we actually play? I don't think we even played with them in New Orleans. I thought Beaufort oh. was the last time we I think we might have right. had those on the table. I wow. think we I think we had them out on display, but I think you're right. I think when we played uh Mig Alley, the B twenty nines were not on the table at uh, yeah. New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was definitely good to get that out there. Uh Brett, what was your uh your take on on how Mig Alley played out? It was fun. I haven't played it in so long. It was fun to see it. Um I uh it just looks so good. I, I like too, I appreciate we had more kinds, more types of aircraft on the table. I think it made that game in particular uh, more more exciting because it wasn't just uh, you know MIGs versus uh, Sabres. You had some other stuff right. going on in there that was really cool. I like that a lot too. That it just the variety was nice. Yeah, I I think for the for everyone who wasn't there and and may not have seen the photos, I, I think it bears discussing that the the whole flow of it was very narrative. It wasn't like two even 500, 700 point forces out there fighting each other. It was, you know, the MIGs are going to come in waves until they get boomed off the table and then the next batch of MIGs are going to show up the next turn in high cover. Um, you know, we brought in F-80s at first to do some flak suppression. Uh, then we had B-29s right behind and we had, you know, F-86s providing fighter cover uh, or running off to the other side of the board to not engage the MIGs. Uh, and then we had Panthers show up and, and Panthers uh, come in and, and kind of clean up some of the targets. So I thought it was super narrative. I really enjoyed it. There's some things that I would tweak a little bit differently in the scenario, I think, uh, for next time. But something that I did differently that I think worked out really well was pairing up a experienced Blood Red Skies player as a flight lead and saying, okay, in this case, Mike Lewis, you're going to be the flight lead of these aircraft. And here's your two new players. Uh, we've briefed them all on the rules, but it's your responsibility to make sure they know what they need to do. And and people, you know, had to had to manage that with varying degrees of hands-on. Sometimes you had to kind of 
tell them exactly how to move. Sometimes you could stand back and just give them suggestions based on how quickly they picked up the game. But I think it, I think it had less people flailing than we might've seen in some other events. Yeah. And I, I would agree as a game master, that's normally what I try to do is set up a situation where I can explain, here's your objective Here's how to play the game. And then by like turn two, I can just sit there and play on my phone. Exactly. Exactly. Just the game. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that uh, that's the good way to do it. Casey, what'd you see in the uh, Miguel game? Um, I saw my paintbrush. I saw some unpainted planes. I painted the planes. So, uh, you know, no, um, I actually really were you doing touch ups on the blue Falcons that you yes. didn't actually paint all the way before you sent them to me? Hey, hey, not that I'm calling um, you out on the podcast. They, um, no, actually, from what I saw, I was busy, you know, kind of setting up and doing some back to scenes stuff or behind the scenes stuff. The uh, flight lead thing was brilliant, and I really want to try that for my events. I really liked it to have, you know, Mike and Dan kind of they helped out with that. So I just thought that was a really good idea. And just, you know, we had lots of people coming in looking, and some people didn't even know that Blood Red Skies had the Megali set. So that was really neat to yeah. see them get super interested in it. Yeah, that was. And I think that led into people who will come back and are going to play in the tournament uh, because they played MIG Alley. They had other tournament events that kept them from doing uh, the Friday Saturday routine. But they said, hey, we definitely want to come back next year and play in the Blood Red Skies tournament. So Can we say how great and helpful Mike Lewis is. Mike Lewis is awesome. So every event that I go to that he shows up, he always ends up doing some staff related Piece and and always helping out, um, even if it's just bringing more airplanes to our Blood Red Skies events. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike Lewis, thank you he very was, much. I'm glad they gave you a staff he was T-shirt. A huge help. <laughs> I, I wish I could have given him more. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> he was he was good. He uh, always takes care of us. So, it's it's good to have. And this is going to sound both arrogant and probably a little strange, but it's good to have a following of people that you consider your good friends that show up to a lot of the same shows and events that you can rely on when everything goes to hell in a handbasket and you look over and go, Mike, can you explain this rules to the person who showed up 30 minutes late to the game? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and you know that it happens. So definitely is good. All right. So let's, let's move on from Thursday. What did everyone else do on Thursday uh, besides painting airplanes, right, Brett? Casey, Steve was at work. <laughs> yeah, we were on I the. Think we we were painting and painting. Yeah, painting, and then went to then went out to dinner. So, um, okay, so Friday, Friday, we all uh, kind of had time to do different stuff in the morning. Uh, I know we uh, um, we had you guys played Oak and Iron, I believe, uh, Brett and uh, and Steve, right? Yeah, it was awesome. I, I love Oak and Iron. Wish I had time to play it more. Wish I had kind of people around me to play it. It's just super fun game. It's like Blood Red Skies with sailboats. Uh, <laughs> you know, super easy to learn, very intuitive, and and just fun. You know, everybody always, there's always that, uh, oh, it's not as, you know, uh, precise as... Right. Black or whatever the black sails or cruel seas or whatever. I don't know what it's right. called, right? But like black yeah, seas. Okay, it's not. And that's why I don't play Check Your Six and I play Blood Red yeah, Skies. Exactly. Right? So like Love Oak and Iron. <laughs> if you haven't played it, you gotta play it. Uh me and Brett got totally tabled. Uh but we did sail our fire ship like a torpedo into some huge British ship. But <laughs> yeah, I mean I loved it. I had a great time. Tables looked awesome. Fun. Excellent. Right. Brett, any comments? Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, one of the one of the things I almost said is my worst was that we just, you know, we were so busy with our own events that we didn't get to play very many games of our own. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I did enjoy that Steve and I took the time to sign up for that, um, that event. And it was a really good time. It was really fun to play. Look great too. It's yeah. a really good looking table. You know, they reenacted some kind of historical thing that happened in the Bahamas and, uh, you know, we got to push little ships around and it was a good time. For me, more than regretting not playing in an event is I didn't get to walk around as much as I had in previous years. And that's my own stupidity. But uh, it, it also came from not forcing myself to go over to the Renaissance more to hit the vendor hall where I normally would then walk through the heresy room, walk through a lot of the other rooms, look at some terrain. I literally didn't even set foot in the upstairs uh, over at the Renaissance. So oops, bad on me. Sorry, team heresy. Uh, didn't get to see you guys, but uh, th that's, that's one of the things I got to figure out for next year, a better way to parcel out my time and, and pry myself away from what's going on at the Hyatt, go over to the main site and see all that. 
Okay, so let's then talk about the big event on Friday, the Furball. Uh, Casey, what would you think of the Furball? I thought it was one of the most coolest things we've done in a long time. Just to see so many people there just having fun. And, you know, just like I said, uh, Mike and Dan helping out, just people grabbing planes. And it was it was so much fun to me. And it's one of the most things I love about this game is to see people who've never played. And then within like 10 minutes, they already know what they're doing. Like right. it's no, it's almost like hands off and just, you know, just people shooting each other down. And like I said, there was a, the husband and wife couple was there too for that one. Wasn't weren't they? The blue Falcon. Yes. The husband was awarded yeah, the blue Falcon so, for shooting right, down his wife. Right. Nice so work. It, it, it Tell us how the so couch is. Like we have to keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brett, what were your thoughts since you're the guy that picked out the aircraft list? So love them or hate them. They were your picks. Uh, yeah, I liked, I liked it a lot. And I think, you know, first first time out, we just wanted to have a good time, and I really liked how it turned. It was just a fun way to do a demo game, if you will. I mean, if you think about it, really, all that was was just an elaborate demo game that could accommodate twenty people or more. And yeah, yeah. It, at the same time, it gave you a chance to like try out some card mechanics and see, like, you know, get a get a feel for what cards do. Even though it was clear that this is not, you know, we were playing in a manner that wasn't the way the regular game plays. It was kind of a fun. Silly Which version. is why I'm glad Andy didn't come over because he never would have spoken to the Lead Pursuit podcast again if he saw how we take, took awesome. his rules and made them something else. <laughs> the only thing I would that I would want to improve maybe next time I don't know if improve is the right word but you know some evolution would be to find a way to make it where it's easier for people to get shot down even more. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I expected people to die more than they did and they didn't. Um, but that that's all right. You know, we can we can figure that out because I was hoping to have more dramatic airplane crashes and deaths and all those things. But yeah. So be it. And, you know, this goes back to the the whole Mike Lewis thing again. Thank you, Mike, for taking all the late show players and running over and creating a whole nother uh, furball table over there and getting all, all those guys uh, a chance to do the same thing but not have to crowd the big table. So I underestimated the amount of space that I would need uh, to get that many players around the table. And uh, that's fine. We'll change that for next year. And maybe it'll be two separate tables because you don't have to have everybody on one table. It does make it a little un- unmanageable in the first turn uh, until everybody starts getting to different advantage levels. Dude, Steve, what'd you see? So the one thing I want to say about the furball, besides again, that just like Mike Lewis, just the stud for helping out, like he said at every event, right? So we play in the furball, and I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. I can't wait to do the furball, right? And then as the furball was starting, I was kind of like, oh my God, what a CF. This is a yep. freaking disaster. Yep. This is going to shit. This is going to be a In the first nightmare. 15 minutes, I said about 70 times to myself, I am never doing the furball Dude. again. This was the worst idea and ever. And then just like, you know, Mike took some people and kind of we spread out a little and kind of adapted a little bit. And at the end of it, that wound up being like a super fun event. Everybody had a really good time. And it was just fun for me to kind of watch like, man, this is really going shitty to kind of adapting and turning it into a cool event. Because I think a lot of times when something starts to go downhill, it's it's tough to kind of like stop that snowball. And like yeah, you said, in the yeah. first 15 minutes, it was not looking good. It was looking like it wasn't going to be good, but <laughs> well, it turned out awesome. I'm glad you brought that up because that, that's something that I think some of the people there may or may not have realized or internalized is it was going terrible. <laughs> the first 15, 20 minutes of that were horrible. Um, but But I think one of the things that we learned from that is it probably helps if people started at different advantage levels, not everybody being advantaged. And then- Oh, by the way, experienced Blood Red Skies players, realize it's a fun demo intro game. If you get left out of the optimum move, time, initiative, whatever, suck it up for everyone else's experience. Because there were a number of times that there were a lot of moving parts. We're trying to get people on the other end of the table to move simultaneously with people on the near end of the table. And people got a little competitive when they shouldn't have been getting competitive. Um, but that's all right. That's, that's it all, it all solved players. itself once it did once advantage state started to be different across the table and there was a bit of separation on activations. That was the only challenge yeah. is that you had 20 or more people all moving aircraft at the same time. And that's the only reason why it was challenging in the beginning. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think, I think rolling for advantage just adds another layer and it would probably get people shot down faster. Uh, so we'll probably put that in, uh, rather than starting everyone advantaged, uh, 
Mike, what did you see? What uh, what did you think about the fur ball? You know, it's one thing like we talked about with like historicals. I want to add more social events like this, where it's like, look, we have our historical game. We could talk about stats of planes and stuff like that. But it's like, yeah, we could just play games and have fun and drink beer and chill. And I felt this was exactly what, like when we started talking about the furball, you know, several months ago, this, what happened was exactly what I had in mind. Right. Well, and I got to give credit where credit's due. Once again, this is another one that you guys reached out and said, could you guys do something like the Battletech Grinder? We had been thinking simultaneously with, could we do something like the Meat Grinder game that that uh, Brett and uh, and Steve and everybody saw, you know, with miniatures that get destroyed and everybody's mono e mono in the in the arena. Um, so, I, you know, you guys clearly gave us the ability to do it by saying, "Hey, here's a good idea. How about you do something that's not hardcore rules? That's a lot of fun." And we're like, "Absolutely, we're already thinking that would be a good idea." So. Um, great minds think alike. <laughs> oh, it worked out. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it was good. Now I, I will say there's some things we'll do different. Uh, I'm going to change some of the the printouts that we give out, and we'll put up up on the Gathering of Eagles uh, part of the Lead Pursuit website, um, just in case people want to do their own, uh, you know, furball event, and just some suggestions for for how to set up the table and and some things like that. Because I think this is the kind of event you can do at any convention as an intro slash demo slash social game. Um, and it it works for a lot of places where a tournament wouldn't work based on time, based on personalities. People may be there more for experience games in a tournament. So just do this instead. Um, and, and we probably will be doing this at uh, Twisted Lords, right, Casey? That's the plan. I think it's good. It's the perfect place for it. Like, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's a better thing than a tournament at Twisted Lords, and I realize that right now John Russell is running screaming around the room, um, but that's all right. We'll, we'll figure that out. I'll have to remember to bring my projector next time so we can project the activation. Oh yeah, that was yeah, yeah that idea. and that was a good point. Talking about that, that was a super easy way to to project. You know what aircraft, what uh, pilot skill level, what advantage state uh, is going to be up there. Because we know the aircraft types. No one's bringing something esoteric. We've we've built the lists. We've built each of the packets. Um, so we know we can make a slideshow that just steps through all those. Well, cool. All right. So that gets us through Friday night. Anything else anyone saw Thursday and Friday they want to talk about? Silence is consent. Good. Saturday, whew, long day for lead pursuit. Um, we did, obviously, the Blood Red Skies tournament first thing in the morning. We streamed it. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we did Aeronautic Imperialis in the afternoon and on into the evening, and that was also a really good time. Uh, the big takeaways, because I'm going to kind of talk about them simultaneous. Uh, tournaments do still draw people in the Blood Red Skies community. There were a number of people that played the narrative games or the, the, um, the furball and said, We'll come back next year for the tournament. So the tournament scene is still alive. Um, Doug is a terrible TO and should never do this again. Uh, that's lesson learned number two. Uh, and the third part is is relating to Aeronautica. Uh, everyone that I asked about Aeronautica being at the Hyatt literally said they would have been happy to go over and do it there. We opted to have it at the Renaissance because that's where all the other 40K and 30K games were going. But in hindsight, looking at our sanity, uh, the feedback from the crowd was, well, host the game wherever it's easiest for y'all. And because the shuttles are reliable, because there's parking at the Hyatt, we'll come over and do it there. I I'm not saying that's going to happen because I do like being in the big hall. Um, but, you know, uh, there's there's some considerations there for tables and for other things. Or or maybe it needs to even change that days and not be on Saturday. Though. But. Uh, like from packing up and it was it there. was and and you you guys did great uh especially for casey i think bottle the food as we were trying to set everything get set up and he realized no one had, had lunch uh but uh no that that was a fast transition and um, kudos to the other pickup game players nobody that i saw was really being a dick about them oh, being no, on our totally tables cool we came it. over we said hey we yeah we got an event coming up in two hours so in 30 minutes can you wrap up what you're doing so we got an hour and a half to set up you know got, people were really really cool about that which uh made me happy because i didn't have to be a jerk and kick anyone off their tables but uh that, and that's once again kind of why i like adepticon it, you know people people just seem uh really courteous there when it comes to gaming tables and stuff like that. Uh, but whatever. Um, that, that's, 
I guess there's probably people in the 40K community who don't see it that way, but that's all right. Uh, all right. So let's talk about the tournament. Um, streaming setup. Steve, you're a freaking rock star. Um, you, you may get your ass kicked every day that you uh, stream DCS and your MiG-21 flights, um, but you nailed it for that streaming setup. Uh, so thank you for that. That was that was super cool. Yeah. You know, it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of moving parts when you can't drive to the event. Right. So like yeah. to get oh, yeah. all of that in a plane, in a suitcase. And I think the biggest thing for us doing that was kind of at some point you just got to do it. Right. And you got to just yep. accept the fact <laughs> you got to accept the fact that the first time you do it, it's not going to be perfect. And I, I personally always a lot of, well, not always, but a lot of times fall into the trap of, I'm not going to put it out there until it's perfect. And if you do that, a lot of times you just never do it. Right. Yeah. So having, oh, yeah. well, having Adepticon is like, we're going to do it. Whatever it's in is the form it's going to be in. Uh, I think it was awesome as a proof of concept. Thanks for all the feedback for people that watched it or watched it later and kind of got in touch with me and said, do this, do that. Uh, I'm excited to to set it up. It looks like we're going to be streaming again from uh, Twisted Lords this summer. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I, I think overall, there's not a lot of that for historicals. You know, there's a lot of it for, you know, you see it for X Wing and you see it for Star Wars Legion, and there, there's not really anybody doing the uh, a good streaming thing for historicals. So I think it's I think it's good to kind of bring some of that stuff over to our side of the gaming world too. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, as as Dion from uh, Gold Squadron Podcast always says, it's the fact that you've done streaming over and over and over again that makes it good, not the fact that you showed up on the right day with the right gear, uh, because he certainly has built a organization and a team that knows what they're doing. We copied a lot from what we saw them do. Uh, so thanks, guys. Thanks, Gold Squadron Podcast. Uh, but we also kind of did our own things in a couple of different ways, and we got some good feedback about what worked, what didn't work. So I think you'll see some things get tweaked, but I think there definitely is a demand for historical streaming. Now, what I will say that we did different was we didn't stream the top table like a lot of events do. Um, we just chose one of the rotational tables to stream because that's how our tournament is set up. And you know, I think... Every, each TO will have to take a look at how they want to stream, whether they're really trying to cover the top table and whether they want the level of scrutiny that's going to go into that, or do they want to just stream a specific table that has the best terrain, the best setup, a unique scenario, whatever, uh, to show how people react to that. Uh, and and there's valid reasons to do both. Um, I just enjoyed not having the pressure of having to have the best players at that table and always be watching them uh, like a hawk for what was going on. Yeah, I do want to add to that. I think one thing we did really, really good with it is we made it very clear that we are just broadcasting the game, right? We are not refs. We are not proctors. Right. We are not influencing this game, right? So if they make mistakes in the rules, take that as that's like table number nine at the tournament. There's two guys yep. playing and they make a mistake in the rules, right? We're just, we're, yeah. we're just relaying the information to you what's happening. And I really liked the... I guess how kind of how genuine that experience was where you had some newer players, some more experienced players. You know, I, I really like the authenticity of that. Yeah. I, th I think there's something to be said for having somebody judging the event versus commenting on the event. Uh, and obviously atomic mass games and, and those guys had separate TOs and judges than their streaming coverage. And I think there's, um, when you have the staff that can do that, then that's the great thing. We're, we're kind of limited in our numbers. Uh, but, you know, not that I'm speaking for uh, Steve and I and, and Brett and Casey, but I think we would be happy to travel to events and do streaming for aerial war games if we didn't have to be the TOs as well, because it's, it's kind of hard to do both. And there's times you don't want to do both. You, you want to see what the the players are going to do when one player gets a rule wrong or makes a mistake. Do they elevate it to a judge? Do they deal with it between themselves? Um, there's, there's some points there that I, I think bear out how good the community is versus how competitive the community is. Um, because I don't recall once a judge being called over to that streaming table. I'm trying to remember. I seem to think I got up at one point for something, but I don't think it was for there, that table. There were a couple of times where I just had, like I was just the one closest to the table, right? And there were like very generic kind of like, oh, does this happen or does that happen? Right. You know, I was like, oh no, that's kind of how you play it out. 
but to say it was like elevated to a judge isn't the right term. It was just more yeah. of like a question and then it was answered and then it was just moved on, which I think we've always said about the blood red skies. There's like very few people that are like, no, that's wrong. And this is, I'm going to appeal. Like it just doesn't happen in this game, which is one of the things that makes it so much fun, honestly. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, there's, there's some people that are highly competitive in the tournament part of Blood Red Skies, but I also think that they generally do a good job of, even when they find themselves being super competitive, they, they tend to check themselves a little bit and go, okay, who's my opponent? Is it another super competitive opponent? Okay, I can act that way. Okay, it's it's a new you know, first time or second time tournament player, I'm going to act differently with them. And that's, that's a good sign in the community that you can, you can be aggressive, you can be competitive, but you also have the sportsmanship to take care of who your opponent is. Mike, any observations from you as the, uh, historicals organizer watching us stream and, uh, and how we did our tournament? No, I'll let go. <clears throat> what you were saying, I, I was happy to have you guys are streaming. You know, it's good to get some of that attention to the historical area. <clears throat> I loved your framework you had for the event itself. You know, it looked good. It looked presentable. Yep. We we need to make it look uh, a little a little less uh, jumbled, but we'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah, but it was nice that oh, here's all the cards, here's the squadrons. Right. Like you could tell everything you need to know about that game from your stream. Yeah, yeah. which I really like. Steve did a good job adding the bullet holes and the shot down airpl- airplane uh, pilot discs and all that. So I think it was it was pretty intuitive for someone to jump into the stream at any point, see what the status of the battle was and for us to be able to call up certain cards and talk about that. So Steve, that was that was super cool. I I enjoyed commenting. I know uh Brett and I felt like we were being the sports commentators out there with our uh, our crazy commentary. Brett, uh, how did that go for you? I really enjoyed that and it actually uh it's inspired me to uh, work on something I think could turn into some some additional podcast content about tactics. I know people have been saying, "Hey, they want to hear more episodes about tactics." And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's when you just say, "Hey, I want to hear some more about tactics." That, that I'm like, "Oh man, where do we even start?" I, I didn't really have a good idea. But after doing the the shoutcasting, the thing I came away with is, you know, we could do some episodes where maybe just starting with some of the more prevalent aircraft traits. So let's right. say like, oh, uh, great climb. Great climb is a trait. How do we turn that? What are the tactics that go along with great climb? And, you know, just talk about how it can be used offensively and defensively, how it pairs with other, you know, other things and how you might exploit it. You know, you, that could be a whole episode, just that, ta- that, that trait, right? A conversation oh, yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. And you, and you, you do that over multiple episodes for some, for really go through all the all the different traits. I think I would learn a lot from that. And I think it would be uh, maybe pretty instructional. And I think that yeah. was the kind of conversation that I found myself falling into when we were shout casting was, you know, analyzing the movements and saying, Hey, well, th- what do you think he's doing here? And that, and that was the fun part for me. And you know, there's, there's always a little bit of showmanship to it. Uh, and, and I enjoyed that, but I also enjoyed the analysis part where we got to say, Oh wait, how many boom chits? How many, what, when is he playing his deep pockets cards? Uh, things, things of that nature. So I thought it was, it was a good tactics discussion uh, as we were going along, yucking it up, acting like we were actually real broadcasters broadcasting a real event. <laughs> well, and that's what makes it interesting to watch is like, I'm not going to watch a stream. I- I'm watching for the commentary as much as I'm watching for the game. Right. right. Well, we got lucky in that we had Andy show up for the commentary partway through. So we did kind of lose a little bit on uh, on game two, but we had uh, Andy show up there. Uh, and if you didn't realize that stream is already out there, that's on YouTube. You can go see that interview and uh, see the things that Andy revealed and talked about. That will hopefully be forthcoming from Warlord uh, later this year, like a compendium and Italians and things like that. Uh, but uh, that was a good opportunity as well. I've really enjoyed having Andy Chambers come over, see what our setup was, see how we ran the event, uh, and realize the level of professionalism we put into hosting a Blood Red Skies tournament. So that was that was a good time. That was really great having him. That was really cool. I know you, you guys got a chance to kind of um, talk and, and realize that everyone got to have a different Andy Chambers experience. You know, mine was mostly kind of the official interview, but that also was kind of Andy and Doug just yucking it up in front of the camera. Um, but then obviously you and, and Brett and, and Casey, Brett, Casey and Steve all got to talk to him separately a little bit in, in each of those areas. 
No, it was actually really nice. It kind of surprised me when he showed up. I looked over and he was there and I was trying to signal you like, Doug, Doug, Andy's here. But no, we got to talk a little bit just about like his whole Adepticon, how it's going, and then just kind of showing him, hey, this is what we're doing and this is what's happening. And I was just, it was really cool to have, you know, the designer of the game there to watch everything. Yeah. And it was one of those things like he, I'm trying to think how to say this, put this, but like you could tell he wanted to be there. Like he was really interested in what we were doing. And I just thought that was really cool. Yep. Yep. It was. All right. Well, Let's move on because we're running long on our usual podcast time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Aeronautica and then we can wrap up with some of the other things that we saw and, and experienced over there at Adepticon. Uh, Aeronautica, I had a blast with that. Uh, we still only got two rounds out. We tried some new scenarios. We made some larger four-person scenarios. We played a five-person trench run scenario and that one uh, – Took a while to get started, kind of like the fur ball, but once it started, it was a bloodbath. Uh, and I think we learned some more from from running that game that we'll do differently uh, next year. Uh, but uh, I really enjoyed the the table layouts that we got to put out there for Aeronautica. We we were able to show people that it isn't just a dogfight game. There's ground objectives. There's all kinds of other cool things you can do. There's Steve, the rogue sky fortress flying around, slapping everybody in the face, uh, doing those kind of things, which, which I thought was, was pretty funny. Um, but I also got to give a shout out to the, uh, Adeptus Titanicus, crowd because they loaned us a bunch of buildings um, that as we got in some of the larger four person games, we needed a little bit more terrain to break up line of sight. Uh, so we did that in some of the low altitude games and, and thanks to the AT guys for, for loaning all that. I know it, uh, it was kind of a last minute ask, but it, it worked out great. Um, Brett, I know you got to play uh, in, in one of the rounds. Uh, how bad did you uh, get beat up by Rhonda? Uh, you know, I felt like I handled myself pretty well. Uh, I did ultimately lose, but it was, uh, I, I, uh, it was a delaying action. You, yeah, you, <laughs> I, I, played, you, I, I didn't know because I didn't expect to play. I brought some, I brought some aircraft, but I did not have the anticipation that I'd be in a game. So I was like, "Oh man, I'm a little rusty. I haven't played in a while." But it all kind of came back to me. I'm still, you know, the movement stuff still kind of throws me off those maneuvers and everything. But I quitted myself fairly well. I, I uh, did not make it easy for my opponent. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Good, good. Steve, how did you enjoy being the crazy rogue uh, AI Sky Fortress out there? Oh, man, you know what? It was great. I was absolutely exhausted uh, at the start of that game with everything that went on with setting up the streaming and then doing the streaming. And then, like you said, it was like, dude, we got to go. We got to pack up. We got to get over there and do this AI event. Yep. Man, when we started, I looked at Casey. I was like, Casey, I don't know if I'm going to get through this, man. I had some coffee. I started shooting down people with those laser cannons and super turbo bombs and whatever other things were on that sky <laughs> fortress man it like brought me back to life that was so much fun uh and uh, you know uh, what's sean who was in that game right yep, yep. just awesome guy I was at both of our uh ai events the last two years absolutely right? so i was picking on him a little bit at the beginning of it and he's just all, you know great sport that he is and that was another event. Well, well, he is, and I think that's a that's a huge call out. Is that he was our sportsman winner because he is one of the most helpful. He's he's the AI equivalent of Mike Lewis, uh, oh, for sure. And and he will help with the event. He'll help setting things up. He'll help you pack stuff up. Um, he'll you know he always wants to help his opponent and wants to make sure everybody has a good time. Um, so absolutely was a was a great time uh, catching up with a lot of people that we hadn't seen since last year playing a couple people that we had uh and so it was it was a good time i, I really enjoyed yeah, it mike the, sorry you missed out you didn't get to see it over there <laughs> you know the other thing i'm going to say about yeah, right? the ai is it's a lot of the same atmosphere that i like about blood red skies like there was a guy in that sky fortress game that was like yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty new at this game. And it was just like, whatever, man, sit down and play and we're going to have fun. And nobody is super competitive. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's having a good good time. And that's kind of, I don't know, it's really refreshing to see that in kind of both of those games that, you know, I, I feel like if you sign up for a lead pursuit game, uh, you're going to have fun. It's going to be a good time. We don't care if you have experience. We don't care if you're a pro at the rules, uh, but we really, really want to focus on you having a good time. And uh, I think we did a really good job of that in that AI event. You know, to echo Steve yeah. on that, like that's perfect what he said is everybody like looking at all the games we did, everybody just had so much fun. There was no one right. like getting upset or frustrated. And if someone didn't know something, like it didn't even have to be us, the player next to him was like, oh, here, I'll show you or I'll explain it. Like, so that's really cool. And that's one of the most fun things to me about all this. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think the only, uh, the only disappointment I have is with AI is there are some people who want to do a tournament event and I just don't feel like doing an AI tournament. I don't have time in my schedule. Um, so you're going to get a super narrative kind of game out of us. It's just a, a bunch of people standing around having a good time. Um, but I am sensitive to the fact that some people were like, oh man, if it had been a tournament, I would have played, but I didn't really want to play just these, these kind of pickup games. But I'll be honest, most everybody who said that also didn't walk around and see what the scenarios were and how they weren't just a dogfight scenario. There's all kinds of crazy things. There's crazy terrain, crazy storms, crazy sky fortresses, um, you know, crazy restrictions like the, the trench. Uh, so there, there were there were things that were going to make it a more fun game than just pushing all your fighters at somebody else and having them push their fighters back at you. The one thing that I think could potentially help with the AI event next year is whoever wrote the scenarios wrote them in like 2.3 font <laughs> on a five by seven index card for some reason. So a little bigger <laughs> font next year could that, help with some that of guy's that. a jerk. Yeah. I, I, I will definitely take that on board. Well, and something else uh, specifically for aeronautica event organizers is if you do something narrative and you're pulling stuff out of, any one of the scenario books, you might want to put the special rules, either Xerox those out of the out of the rule book or, or retype them and put them uh, in, in the back page of whatever your scenario packet is, because not everybody plays them. So not everybody knows how to fly at low altitude, at altitudes one and two. Not everybody knows how to use, um, you know, like the storm cloud rule from one of the scenarios. There's, there's a lot of scenario special rules that um, you, you probably need to just, rather than making someone dig through their rule books, look for it the first time, just put it in the in the actual event packet so that that way they can reference it. Uh, they know what special rules apply. And if they want to go read the full section, they can go do that. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps up what we saw for our events. Mike, I know you saw far more than we did because you were running historicals. What was, was kind of your big takeaway of historicals? What was really different this year from last year? Yeah, I felt it was a lot busier this year. Yeah, you know, I think we had a lot more people over there. Absolutely. Uh, bolt action, firelock all did very well. I couldn't get Saga those stinky bolt space. action people away from my tables. I mean, we were like two warlord games thrown in a corner over there. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. So level of containment yeah. zone for you guys next year. <laughs> exactly. No, it was good. I I thought it was it was definitely had more historical players than last year when we were there. Yeah. And, you know, I'm hoping that trend continues. A lot of us just could be trying to find GMs to run games. I mean, I still look at the event games. We probably had 90% of tickets sold. Right. For the event games over the course of the weekend. So, you know, there's a demand for them. We just need to get people to run more games well, and, and then spread out what days are running them on. Right. And so for somebody who doesn't know and isn't, you know, necessarily an Adeptcon veteran, what are you looking for? In an event game, what are, what are kind of some of the things that you think are hits? Because there are people that have come to Adepticon, have, have tried to host a game and had low or no turnout. What are the kind of things you see that people want to play? Mainstream rules are definitely part of that. It's we can appreciate the homebrewed system, you know, something a little more esoteric. Like Steve Fret did really solid all weekend with this small deli space. Now, that's a rule set he's developed. I would say it's a little more professional than some other homebrew ones. You know, he's got nice printed copies right, and he's right. got decades of experience with that. His is very much the exception to that. Other than that, you're looking at two fat lardies rules, warlord rules. That's about right. it. You know, it, it's very, it's the larger companies, popular rules, mainstream rules. People are familiar with them. They want to try them right. out. Well, and I think that's a, a key thought for each of the game masters or any prospective game masters is you don't need the most historically accurate, the most large army, you know, beautiful presentation game. People want to try a lot of these rule sets. And so you want something that will play quick. They won't have to, you know, bring any armies or anything. And, and mm -hmm. that you probably can do multiple iterations of, um, because people will show up late. People will, will not be able to make it on the day that you wanted to do it. And, and the, especially the warlord rule sets really lend themselves to that, um, that they're very simplified, very straightforward, generally not, I'm not looking at you cruel seas. Um, but they're, sure. they're generally straightforward rule sets that you can do 
a very narrative game with and and not make it huge. Or you can do like you, you know, guys did for Gettysburg and we fight all of what, day two at Gettysburg? <laughs> yeah. Just give it a few years. <laughs> um, you know, but the nice thing about Black Powder, which we use for that, you can teach someone how to play Black Powder in five, ten minutes. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I don't want to – I want to spend the barest and minimum of time possible teaching the rules so I can get the players – playing the game and having fun. No, I, I want to spend the least time learning the rules so I can troll Don and ask about the decision points of Gettysburg and have an argument for like three hours over beers yeah. about that. So <laughs> I'm glad you bring that up, Doug, because I had to leave early. Mike, what was the verdict? Dan Sickles, hero or goat of Gettysburg. I, I didn't get to see the end result. You know, actually this time it worked out pretty well for the union. Like as much as I was trying to be generous to the Confederates, they didn't even take the peach oh, orchard. <laughs> they, they took Devil's Den, but, and you know, they had troops on big round top, but the union was pushing. It was going to start inflicting really Bring large damage over the next few turns. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that, that game you know, was, was really cool to see and, and to see you guys get, uh, you know, so in depth with it. But once again, I think it's a success, like you said, because black powder is so easy to teach. You you spend more right. time on the event, not on the rules. People are familiar with the rules. You know, also I think having a catchy title, you know, Ours was called Dan Sickles did nothing wrong. It's funny, but you're going to look at right, that. Right. Well, there's there's a point to that in sculpting how you draw people into your game as a GM yeah. is catchy titles, you know, kind of funny paragraphs when you submit your text. If you submit text that says, this will be playing Black Powder using Gettysburg figures in epic scale, then, you know, no one's going to. No one's going to sign up for that. If you say something funny like, hey, we're going to prove that Dan Sickles was in fact a moron. Um, you know, if you, you put that in your in your text blurb, you're going to catch people who go, oh, okay, this is a game. It's an experience. This is not a serious, competitive, uber historical Correct. kind of event. Well, and another thing is, I you know, and I tell this to pretty much all GMs, TOs, I help run the Adepticon Facebook. I will promote your game that you're running. Right. I just need a write-up. So I can post something. Absolutely. Yeah. Give me some pictures. Give me a write up. We'll post it. So I think that helps too. Is you know get your stuff in early, so it's in the cart, and we can start promoting it ahead of cart launch. It, especially for something you know, forty k team. No one's worried about people showing up playing yeah, that. Right. <laughs> but if you're writing something that's maybe a little more different in one of the off times, no, promote it, and we'll get people there. Well, I think there's a. A definite difference between these kind of games, and I'm really going to piss off a lot of the historical crowd here, and what you see at HMGS events. Because my perception, and all my bros at NashCon and everywhere else, feel free to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, my perception is each or the majority of those pickup, demo, whatever kind of games uh, – those are attempts to be super historical, unless they're purely experience games like, you know, the guys with the foot and a half long sailboats uh, dressed as a pirate. Sure. Those are experience games. Those are those are, are fun kind of things. But it seems to me that there's a lot of people that are concentrating on my historical simulation of this battle rather than, hey, we're all going to stand around, drink beer and refight the second day of Gettysburg. Who cares who wins? Doesn't matter if it's a historical outcome or not. And building on that, Doug, it's this is my historical simulation of this battle using a rule set that you've never heard of. <laughs> right. That I'm going to spend half an hour teaching you. Yes. Like, I, I I tell people I'm an historian. I have a bachelor's in history, so it counts. I'm a historian. <laughs> and I love naval history. I have read incredibly dry naval history books. I once saw a six hour scheduled game for a fight between like six dreadnoughts for six dreadnoughts. And my response was, oh, oh no, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of watched people play that and there were charts upon charts and all this. I'm like, this is horrible. We could do victory at sea. We could be done two hours and have a blast. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think it comes down to there's a there's a place for those kind of games and there's a place for sure. those games at, at certain events. But I think you have to be honest with yourself and say, is that going to draw people and is that going to draw repeat crowds? Because what's your goal? Yeah, here? exactly. Are, are you are you testing a rule set? Are you play testing? Are you validating it? Are you demonstrating historical knowledge of a event or are you getting around a table and pushing little plastic airplanes or toy soldiers around and having fun? 
Exactly. And we keep talking about, you know, hey, would we want to do Pickett's Charge? I don't think that'd be that fun of an event game because one side's going to move forward, the other side shoots right. you. <laughs> I would happily play that locally because I think that could be kind of fun. But for Adepticon, I want a game where I have done this enough that's playability is high and I can, as much as I can, ensure it will be fun for the players. Right. right. And that is my primary leading thing. If I have to make some stuff up or add a few things, I, I'm willing to bend stuff a little bit to do that. Now, with the Gaysburg game, I didn't have to, but I think back several years ago, we wanted to do a Mediterranean naval battle, and there just aren't that many large surface engagements. Right. So we just kind of made one up. <laughs> it works. It was fun. <laughs> have all the right belligerents and you're good. Exactly. Well, excellent. Well, guys, we have been talking for quite a while. It's time to stop boring all of our listeners uh, who disconnected long ago. Uh, I'll go around the room real quick. Uh, anything that people have in wrap up, Casey, from you, anything uh, to wrap up that you want to throw away? No, just that, you know what? It was an awesome, awesome four days. Like I loved it. My sides hurt for days afterwards from laughing so hard. Um, I'm glad we're all members. I thought of- that was for sleeping on the couch. <laughs> yes. Yeah, is that what they call it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know we had so much fun we're all uh, ordained members of the pink donkey now so you know yes it was just a fantastic time lots of games everybody was so friendly um i just can't wait to go again i'm looking forward to twist of the lords in oklahoma but i just can't wait for all of us to be back together again at adepticon next year absolutely so if you don't get the pink donkey joke uh apparently you don't go to the right restaurants when you're at adepticon (laughs) if you do not go to fat rosie's you are missing out and more importantly, uh, if you don't go to Fat Rosie's at 9.30 p.m. at night when the shot glass filled airplanes with sparklers lit uh, are being passed around the bar, uh, you've totally missed out. So, yes, if you hear pink donkey references, uh, there were multicolored donkeys painted on the wall. And, well, I guess our favorite became the pink donkey. So that's our our new uh, our new mascot for Adepticon. Uh, well, on that note, oh, I didn't need to invite or yeah, anything. Well, yeah, you know, we had to talk bad about you. We we had to have our own time to, to say fair. mean things about the Adepticon staff that had rolled out the red carpet for us. Uh, all right, wrapping up, Brett. Anything else that you want to share? I really loved the room we were in this year. It was it felt like a real upgrade from the previous year. And I shout out to uh, Phil and his wife. They had that that great vendor. Uh, stations right outside the front doors for everything historical. That was awesome. Absolutely. Phil and Tina take great care of us on the Leap Suit podcast. Uh, they're always happy to have us throw our stuff out there. So there's an opportunity for people to buy Leap Pursuit tokens, buy all the stuff you can't get for Blood Red Skies uh, that easily, and then to have, obviously, uh, all the different airplanes and things out there um, as as needed. So that was super cool. Phil and Tina, thanks again. You guys are great partners uh, in all of this. We look forward to seeing you at, uh, I guess the next one will be Twisted Lords. All right, Steve, what else? All right, Doug, hear me out. Oh, geez. Next year, oh, no. Adepticon, day three Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge, but right around where the uh, Copes of Trees is, there's like a rogue artillery battery <laughs> that just they is run by me want. and they get to shoot whoever they want. I think that sounds Day like a three. great game. Perfect. What do you think? I, I, I want to see Don Ayers lose his mind when you do that. I think it's I think it's gotta happen now. That's fine. He'll just bring Long Street with his jetpack and flamethrower <laughs> exactly. and power Long armor. With the, with the flamethrower. There we go. That nice. will that will solve all the problems. Oh. Outstanding. All right. Mike, anything that you want to throw out in closing? No, I'm just, you know, all Ray start prepping for next year. So. Absolutely. People need to understand that there's, there is not a moment that goes to waste after uh, Adepticon 2023 shuts down, planning for 24 starts. We've started our planning on lead pursuit. Um, and, you know, I just want to say to you guys at Adepticon, thanks for the, for rolling out the red carpet. Um, you took good care of us. Uh, there's a few loose ends we'll tighten up on our end uh, after the fact. Um, but, uh you know, super, super great setup. You let us do what we wanted to do. We whined like little babies about needing more tables and we got more tables. Um, and we, uh, and we set everything up at the corner and, and basically took it over and made it our, uh, our painting sweatshop and streaming studio. So thanks for letting us do that. I, I really appreciate it because, uh, not a lot of other events would have given us that much leeway. Yeah, you're very welcome. You know, like I said, looking forward to next year and 
seeing what we can come up with. Well, all right. Well, I'll leave it here at that. Furball too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll leave it here with that and say that uh, in the words of Steve, the best MiG-21 pilot in the Eastern Bloc, keep climbing for advantage. Dude, I think there's something to that. Just, you know, real quick things. Hey, best thing was the shuttle. Worst thing was, you know, Doug snored. Are there show notes, Doug? There are. Yes, there were show notes. He told you like three days ago. Wow, Casey the Hammer. Also, you didn't snore. You cuddled too hard, but you didn't snore. I cuddled too hard. You left without giving me a goodbye cuddle. I, I'm, I'm so disappointed. I heard the door click closed at 530 and I didn't even get a goodbye cuddle. You also smell different when you're asleep than when you're awake, but that's a different podcast. All right, I found him. I found him. I found him.